Hi, I'm Rajiv, and this is my handmade home in New York City. Uh, when people ask me what I do for a living, I say I'm a movie star. I am a washed up movie star. I kind of live an unusual life where leisure and my profession that the lines are very skewed. Something that was a hobby for 10 years for me sometimes becomes a profession. That's why I, I spend a lot of time on doing the things that I love doing. I started a business about 10 years ago doing calligraphy called Letters in Ink. I was originally doing things like wedding invitations and then one day a friend suggested that I approach some local cafes and restaurants about redoing their chalkboards going into restaurants and saying like, hey, can I redo that chalkboard? And be like, why? Because it's ugly and I can make it beautiful and maybe it'll help your business. How much? Hmm. Nothing. Okay, knock yourself out. So I'd do it and then I'd leave my business card and then it would rain. And when it would rain, I would get a phone call. Hey, can you come back and do that chalkboard? And that's when I would charge them. I got some press and then word spread and I carved out a little niche for myself. When I think about the projects that really stand out over the last 10 years, the main one is this room that I completely covered in chalk for the Kipps Bay Show House. I worked on that project for about a week, night and day, and then it was open to the public. And the question that everybody asked was, can I touch it? And we said, absolutely, touch it and see what happens. There was this tension between the people in the room and the walls. Uh, a lot of people didn't believe that it was real chalk. They thought maybe it was chalk and that we had sprayed it with some kind of spray. And I never do that. If you, if you spray chalk work, you lose a lot of the powdery edges. And we wanted it to be impermanent. We wanted people to understand that you put it up and if you brush up against it, it is gone. So in my space, I thought, why don't I paint the walls and the ceiling of one space with chalkboard paint and then kind of go crazy. I did that with the intention of changing it regularly and it has been up for eight years. It has gotten um, weathered over the years from people passing through. I didn't anticipate what it would look like, but I, I actually really like the remnants of architecture that has been worn down with time. Lots of bags and coats. The kitchen was the only room up until recently that I didn't love in this apartment. I decided it was time to make this kitchen a little jewel box, make it everything that I have ever dreamed of in a kitchen. And most of the stuff I was able to just do myself. So the very first thing I started with was the wood paneling. I wanted the kitchen to feel like an old pre-war tenement kitchen. And it was really simple to just get this pine wainscoting, nail it up and build up the moldings, the baseboards and the chair rail. I had a contractor come in and put in the crown molding. That wasn't there either. The other huge job that I did myself was I painted the cupboards. And that was a lot of work. I took all the doors off. Um, I took all the shelves out, everything was painted with oil paint, so it had to be primed and sanded and then painted two or three times. The glass wasn't this glass. It was just this frosted glass that was very modern looking. And something I love about old buildings is when you can look at the windows and you see these wavy panels of glass that are hand blown. When I was in high school and college, I spent all my summers working as a costumed historical interpreter at a place called Black Creek Pioneer Village. It's Canada's equivalent to colonial Williamsburg. It wasn't just life-changing because I learned so many manual skills, but being in that environment, in buildings that were 200 years old, utilitarian objects in these buildings were so beautiful. There were irons with little, like the handles were little swan's heads and they didn't have to put a swan's head on that iron, but they did. That was the case with every single thing in these buildings. Useful things could be very beautiful. That, that really inspired me. Look at this sink. 
Look at this sink. It is handmade in England by Shaw's. Like everything that goes along with the whole dishwashing process now is fun because it's beautiful. Like this, oh, hello, vintage Munich tea towel that I got when I lived in Germany. Oh, hello, hand-blown soap bottle with a little vintage spigot. Oh, hello, dishcloth that was hand-woven by my friend Deborah. And then we have the dishes. Working at Pioneer Village, I was introduced to old china and silverware. So I started collecting ironstone china. This is early American pressed glass. At an antique store, a glass like this would go for, I don't know, 30 bucks. But you can find stuff like this if you know how to spot it. You can find it at like junk stores. So people come over and they've broken stuff before and they felt really bad. And I'm like, don't worry about it. It's fine, it's just $2. If it breaks, it's fine. If the marble gets stained, eh. It already has some spots on it and I love them. This is my silver. Not silver plate. There's a big difference. Every fork, every spoon in there averages about a hundred bucks. I collected piece by piece since I was a little kid. Like I'd get my birthday money and I'd go and buy a fork. And if you look very closely, you can see we have the lion en passant, which means that that was made in London. And then we have the leopard's head, which means that it was made in Great Britain. And then we have the monarch's head. And the monarch's head on this one is a young Queen Victoria. So this was made under Queen Victoria's reign. And then we have a letter. And the letter is a Q. So let's go to our book. There's Queen Victoria's head, 1854. They didn't have electric lights in 1854. This was made by natural light or by oil lamp. I'm, I'm obsessed. These are my cutting boards, which I made. I make soap with goat's milk, coconut oil, and olive oil, and then I put a little bit of frankincense and myrrh in it. That's exclusively what I use in here. I package it up too. I call it wise man soap, the soap that Jesus would have used. Sometimes when people talk about me, they use that phrase, butcher, baker, candlestick maker. I mm, haven't done any butchering. Another aspect of my time in the kitchen is cooking traditional Tamil food. So my parents are from Sri Lanka and I am Tamil. That is an ethnicity and a language for those who don't know. And it is the best food in the world. And there are some very specific tools that are required to make this food. And the stuff is just so beautiful. Like this is used for a kind of um, rice patty that's made with rice flour mixed with some boiling water. You put the dough in here, put the plunger in, and then you squeeze out these vermicelli noodles onto these mats that are woven with strips of bamboo. And then those little patties get steamed. So it's another added aspect of the kitchen that I love. It's this mix of New York tenement and Sri Lanka. It's always been a dream to learn something on the piano. And when the pandemic started, I thought, okay, I am going to challenge myself to learn one Chopin nocturne. I just thought, let's, let's just take it bar by bar. One bar, that's all. At the end of a year, I can now sort of play one nocturne. It has been really fulfilling to sit down at the piano and to be able to play one of his pieces from beginning to end. A lot of the stuff in here is actually from flea markets and thrift stores. New York has great flea markets and great thrift stores. People are coming and going and dying all the time. And you can find great stuff that's really, really affordable. The coffee table in the living room was 25 bucks, a nice sort of bronze frame, but it didn't have any glass in it. So I bought it and then I got some mirror from just a glass store. And it was actually old mirror that they cut down to size. I wanted to actually make it look antique. So I distressed the mirror myself. You take some nasty stuff called muriatic acid and you spray it on the back 
of the mirror and it starts to eat away at the silver. So it happens really quickly. You just sort of, you have to time it and get it to the level where you want it. If you leave it on for too long, it'll take off all the silver. Here is a, a little project about my friend who's obsessed with his cat. And I thought I should write a little kid's book. And this is a little story about Bernardo's cat, Agnes. Bernardo's a hipster who lives in Brooklyn. And the cat gets angry sometimes when he leaves. This is my landscape painting, which is a copy of a painting from the 1850s by an Irish painter, George Barrett. I have always dreamed of painting landscapes. And one of the ways artists have traditionally learned how to paint is actually by copying paintings, copying paintings by the masters. I printed this high-res image off the internet and zoomed in and worked on this very slowly for the course of eight months. It's oil paint, so it had to be done in layers, and the layers um, often would have to dry before I did the next layer. But it was a big challenge that ended up working. Uh, I love this thing. This room is why I rented this apartment because of the wonderful light that streams in really for most of the day. These lace curtains are pure cotton. It is very, very hard to find pure cotton lace today. Most mills that made this stuff are long gone. So one of the few places left in the world where they still weave the old way is in Lyon, France. And that's where this comes from. Lace curtains fluttering in the breeze. Look at, look what's happening. Good boy. Yeah. Yeah. I was walking down the street one day years ago and I saw a cab stop on the side of the road. The door opened and this fluffy thing just jumped out and ran into a building where a doorman had opened the door for him. I was like, did I, did I just imagine this? So some, some very careful detective work revealed to me that Prince lived down the street and I befriended his owners. They offered to leave him here when they went out of town. I was taking a painting class at the Art Students League and my teacher's mantra was paint what you see, not what you know. Once when I was doggy sitting Prince, I thought, let me try painting him, and it and it turned out it turned out great. I was really happy with the with the result. I love that dog so much. I apprentice with a wonderful potter in Connecticut. Guy Wolf makes all of Martha Stewart's flower pots. He's been making flower pots for most of his life. I read about him in Martha's magazine and was determined to learn from him, so I begged him to let me come and visit, and the rest is history. I've been going there for about 10 years now. This pot was made by Guy, this beautiful pot was made by Guy, and this pot was made by me. The bed is from the 1830s, and it's actually a little shorter than a normal twin bed, but then, I found out that there's a mattress maker in the Bronx, Charles H. Beckley. They have been making mattresses, horsehair mattresses by hand. They came here, measured the bed, made this wonderful mattress. It's really, really comfortable. Look at this. The corner is, is hand finished. So there are hand tied springs in here, layers of horsehair and cotton. Great mattress, well made, made to last. Remember Deborah, my weaver friend who made my towels in the kitchen? She made this for me too. I make a lot of things by hand. So when I'm going out and buying something, I want something that is well made. I lived in Germany for a year and a very good friend of mine was telling me that her grandmother had a saying, Wir sind zu arme um billig zu kaufen. We're too poor to buy cheap things. I feel like my bike is my best friend. It's from 1940, it was made in Munich. 
I brought it back with me. It's built to last. It's a solid steel frame. It has a great bell. Art supplies take priority over clothes for me. This is the bigger closet. The canvases are up there. This is full of beautiful wool. Um, I'm always, I always have a knitting project on the go. This is a hat in progress. All my books, paper, sketch pads, oil paints. During the pandemic, I thought I would try my hand at book binding and I'm kind of hooked now. I made this a few weeks ago. It's a watercolor sketchbook. You need to have proper watercolor paper in order to have uh, the pages stay flat so that they don't buckle and curl. Let's talk clothes. Oh, hello, Marie Kondo. So when I read Marie Kondo's book, that philosophy really spoke to me, that the objects that you have in your life should be meaningful to you and should make you happy. So I did it. I condoed this place. I got rid of anything that did not make me happy. Just the things that spark joy. Um, there was a lot more. When I was a little kid, I watched The Sound of Music and I was like, I want to dress like that. But it didn't seem possible. And then I started working at Pioneer Village and was wearing tweed in, in my costume, fulfilled that tweed need. When I became an adult, I commissioned some tweed suits to be made. And then I really felt like these are my clothes. This is my style. Deborah wove this cloth. This suit took about three years to make. The sheep, she picked two different sheep that were two shades of brown. You can see the dark and the light. Those are the two different sheep. It's lined with salmon colored silk. Um, I just love it. I love the color combo. The other thing that's in this closet that I wear in the winter, I have four of them, are these sweaters called Gansies. They're fisherman sweaters. There's something really sentimental about these fisherman sweaters. They were a real working man's garment. Every village, had their own pattern. So I found a knitting collective in Yorkshire where there's a group of women that still make Gansies the old way with real Yorkshire wool. And this is what came back. Knitted for me by Marion Brocklehurst, who is 93 this year, and she knits Gansies for Daniel Day-Lewis. It's like a hug. The clothes in there, they all have a story and they have meaning in them and every time I put on something that was handmade. I'm thinking of the person that made it. If someone told me there was a, a, a shrine for Marie Kondo, I, I would go and worship at the shrine and take flowers and bow. That's how she got to me. Oh, what do we want to wear today? A nice gray t-shirt? Oh, maybe a striped one. Let's look through our blues. This space became a lot emptier after the whole Marie Kondo thing, but what it turned into was a kind of canvas, a kind of nice blank canvas for bringing things in that don't stay forever. Come in, they visit, they add joy, then they die, and my mind feels a lot lighter. Thanks for watching, and if you like this video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe to Handmade for more home tours just like this one.